This is Sushmita Gaude and I am thrilled to be your host for today. BJPI was established in the year 1887 and is upholding its proud legacy of over a century filled with brilliance and educational prowess. Furthermore, it has thrived in nurturing the brightest minds of the society. Technomanza has always been the prime platform where the flame of expertise has been meritoriously passed on to light more torches. Pioneers of diverse fields including Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, Dr. John Mather, Dr. Henry Schaefer and many others have graced the Knovanza with their presence by progressively illuminating young minds to new areas of interest. Behold, because today we are elated to add a truly inspirational name to our glorious list of dignitaries. Our guest today is not only a brilliant biomedical engineer, but also a notable innovator who has opened numerous new fields of research and inspired several generations of students with his creativity and dedication. Today, we are pleased to welcome the phenomenal Dr. Nicholas Opie. Dr. Opie is the founding director and CTO of Synchron, a company pioneering the development of endovascular bionic technology. He now leads a world-class R&D team that has designed and developed the world's first brain recording device that can be implanted without open brain surgery and is diversified to address a wide range of neurological conditions. Over the years, his research led him to be recognized as a leader in bioelectronics medicine, a field focused on developing technologies that interact with the electrical systems of the body. Author of more than 50 scientific papers, he has over 15 years of experience in the domain of neural interfaces. Sir is also the co-head of Vascular Bionics Laboratory. Sir, this small introduction wouldn't do enough justice to you. You have blended the eloquent qualities of hard work and persistence with absolute sublimity which can never be unseen. We are truly honored by your presence today. We will have a Q&A session after the lecture, so please leave your questions in the live chat below. Sir will be sharing with us his expert outlook on brain machine interface. So, without any further ado, let's be a part of a conversation regarding our shared future under the, under the guidance of clearly the best. Sir, passing it on to you now. Uh, thank you, Sis Mayda. That was a um, very beautiful introduction, so I, I appreciate that. Uh, and, and hopefully the uh, the presentation I give will, will give rise to a, a number of questions that you guys might have in the audience and and also certainly if any of you are interested in following the, the footsteps uh, that I've followed, it's certainly been a very uh, rewarding journey and a, a, long, a long path ahead, but I've, I've enjoyed any, every minute of it. So I'm just going to share my screen here and go through a couple of, of slides, uh, a presentation I have on uh, the work we've been doing on, on brain machine interfaces. Uh, as this meter pointed out, I'm Associate Professor and Head of the Vascular Bionics Laboratory at the Department of Melbourne, uh, Department of Medicine at the University of Melbourne, and the founding CTO of a company called Synchron that we started up to translate the research that we've been doing into uh, a commercial product to allow people um, to be able to use our technology to, to enhance the quality of their lives. So when we started thinking about uh, brain machine interfaces, one thing that you need to think about is paralysis. Uh, and I like this slide because here, as everyone would know, is, is Superman. Um, but trauma and disease, uh, a couple of reasons that you can turn Superman into, into this man, which is Christopher Reeves. He had a horrific accident a number of years back uh, and he lost the ability to, to walk. And this is you know, particularly prevalent in our, in our society. In, in the US, there's about 1.2 million people with, with spinal cord injury, you know, 12,000 cases, uh, new cases every year. Uh, but really what sticks out to me is that majority of these, 55%, are, are, young, are young individuals and nearly all of them are, are male. Um, there's obviously no cure to spinal cord injury and, and certainly this is, this is something that can have obviously permanent but very long-lasting impacts on on the lives of those young individuals uh, and and their families and carers so when we started out making brain machine interfaces uh, we really wanted to help those that that through through accident or or, or trauma or otherwise were, were unable to 
to walk. Paralysis has, has many different forms. Uh, obviously, there's spinal cord injury, but it can also be paralyzed from uh, different conditions such as amputations or, or loss of limb or, or degenerative conditions such as uh, motor neuron disease or ALS or, or, or stroke and, and other, other conditions that might occur throughout your life. Uh, in Australia, there's about 60,000 and, and you know, about 6 million Americans. And a, a study pr uh, printed a few years ago suggested that you know, by 2025, which, which isn't too far away now, uh, there'll be about 50 million people in developed economies that could benefit from some sort of brain machine interface, a technology that would allow them to uh, communicate or, or use prosthetic limbs and arms. Uh, for, for me, my definition of a brain machine interface is a device that can translate neural information, can translate your thoughts into commands that are capable of controlling external software or hardware, such as a computer, a robotic limb, uh, vehicles such as wheelchairs and exoskeletons, or really any way that technology can allow people to use their minds directly to interact with with their um, their environment. Here's a video that uh, was a few years ago now. This is a lady who had a skiing accident, uh, and she severed her spinal cord and was unable to to walk after that. Uh, what you can see here is, is you know, for the first time, she is using what's called an exoskeleton uh, to to stand and, and to walk around the the room. Her spinal cord is still damaged; it will, it will always be damaged. But she is now able to to use this technology uh, to move around, as as you can see on in the video. Uh, one of the you know, this is amazing technology, absolutely. But we want to go a step further than this. What you can see here is she needs to use her arms to hold um, hold the sticks to allow her to, to balance and to walk, and, and and certainly you know she's carrying quite a heavy heavy load. What we would like to do is find a way where we can interact or interface directly with the brain to allow the brain to control external uh, equipment, and that could be like I was saying, computers or laptops, prosthetic arms. Uh, vehicles, your your home environment, uh, and obviously exoskeletons like she like she was using. If there were if there's a way that the brain can be used to control these devices, then then that's where we're sort of trying to head. Uh, a number of years ago, a, uh, a you know, this graph was demonstrated by uh, you know, Jack Judy, a professor in University uh, of Florida. Uh, working with DARPA at the time that was looking at the in neural information, so how much uh, how much information you can extract from the brain as a function of how long the, the participant has been using the device. In the blue line down the bottom, you can see that you know, there's quite a quite a steady uh, you know, amount of information can be gained after a, after a training period that can last for their life. But the amount of neural information, how high it is on the uh, on the axis is not is not that great, and as you can see in the image on the right, these uh, surface peripheral electrodes are placed on on the scalp. Um, daily applications required. Uh, the the skull itself blocks some of the signals that that you want to try and get from the brain, and at the moment, it's it's really only binary information that that can be extracted a, a yes no sort of signal from within the brain. There is no surgery required, which is which is fantastic, but to date these devices just don't have the ability to extract enough information to control sophisticated devices like prosthetic limbs. In the red, you can see what happens if you get under the skull. So again, there's a period of training and you, you get more information, but after a period of time, the brain starts to reject the electrodes that are, that are implanted into the brain itself and the ability of these decreases. Now, certainly a lot of work has gone into um, to keep this red line quite high, uh, but as you'll see there, and there are some very good examples of this technology being used by people with paralysis to control computers, and I'll, I'll show you those in a minute. But certainly there has been a concern that if you, 
if you place devices in the brain itself, then, then the brain might have a response that would reject these and stop them working for the lifetime of the patient. Here's an example of what's called a subdural grid array. What happens is you remove a large portion of the skull, you put some of these electrodes directly onto the brain surface, and then, as you can see in this, this image that was, uh, this video that was taken back in 2013, uh, which I'll play again, uh, the man who obviously cannot move his arms and cannot move his legs was able to control this robotic arm after, even only after a day of, of training and using it, uh, which is really quite quite amazing. Obviously, there are there are limitations of, of this sort of technology. There's a large craniotomy; a large part of the brain is is removed to insert the electrodes, which leads to a to a high infection risk. Uh, the surface recordings only, which means only the surface of the brain can be recorded from, and it's you know, in its current state, it's it's wired. So there are wires coming out of of the brain. You can get very large coverage, which is which is useful, uh, and you know, home use has been demonstrated uh, with a, with a small number of channels with with good signal quality. Moving on to something called a penetrating array, and what you can see from from this um, this video from 2017 is this lady with a uh, an implant that comes out of her head using this um, this connector here, and these electrodes here are very small, but they're quite like nails. Again, you need to remove some of the skull, you then pneumatically insert these these nails directly into the brain, uh, and so. You, there is direct brain trauma caused from these electrodes. There has been some cases of electrode rejection and, and certainly because of the, the technology at the moment uh, and the requirement to have these, these large uh, external parts of the system, it's only able to be used in a lab or a hospital and it can't be used at home to date. Uh, again, they're wired, there's, there's wires coming from the, from the brain uh, out. And, and again, that's, that's a, uh, a risk of infection. However, as you did see in the, in the video, uh, the lady, and I'll play that again, the lady is very good at being able to navigate around the screen using her mind. And when she gets to a letter that she would like to activate, she can use her mind to click on that letter and to communicate as if uh, as if you or I were using a, a keyboard, she's able to do this even though she can't move her arms or legs. And uh, and certainly, this is this is some amazing work that's come out of out of the US. What we wanted to do was come up with a way that we could achieve the same uh, efficacy. We could allow people with paralysis to control communication systems and software. Uh, such as the ones you just saw, but do it in a way that didn't require invasive surgery. Uh, we didn't want to have any of the skull removal. We didn't want to have electrodes that penetrated into the brain directly, but we did want to get under the skull. That was important to keep the signal quality high. Uh, we wanted to make sure that this system could be used independently and at home by the, by the person, so they weren't restricted to to a laboratory or, or a hospital, uh, and we want to have obviously good signal quality and to allow them to go home having a wireless system. What we've decided to do, uh, and we've been working on this for a number of years now, is design a device that can be implanted to the brain underneath the skull without brain surgery by using blood vessels as the way to get there. The stentrode is inserted by a catheter into the jugular vein and maneuvered into the brain without the need for open brain surgery. The sensors are built onto a self-expanding stent that engages into the wall of the vein and which is designed to maintain blood flow. Over time, cells may gradually grow over the sensors and incorporate them into the tissue. The sensors are placed immediately adjacent to the control center in the brain, known as the motor cortex. The patient may be paralyzed, but their motor control center can still be activated simply by thinking. The system is designed to transmit these brain signals out of the brain, out of the vein, and into a unit implanted under the skin in the chest. 
This unit is programmed to pick up brain signals continuously and when connected to an external receiver may send them to a computer. The command center in the brain is now directly connected to software and the patient would attempt to train their brain for direct operating system control by thinking. Direct brain control of a mouse, a keyboard, exoskeletons and even vehicles may become possible. Technology to restore independence. So, how do we do it? Uh, and for the next few slides, I'm going to take you through our process of how we were able to design a device and, and develop this technology and why um, we had confidence before we started our human trials that this would, would, be, a, would be a good way to address the problem of, of brain-machine interfaces. What you can see on the left here is a human head uh, it's called a, an angiogram or a venogram where you inject dye into the vessels and as you can see in this image, the vessels under x-ray light up. What you might notice is that one, there are a lot of vessels in the brain and two, there are very large vessels, particularly around uh, areas of interest. If you look to the right, this is a, uh, a 3D reconstruction of about 50 patients with MRIs as well as with uh, the venography or angiography. And you can see in the blue is the, the veins that, that are around the, you know, underneath the skull but on top of the brain and how they relate to uh, areas such as the motor cortex shown in red and the sensory cortex shown in yellow. So what we're trying to do is insert a device through the jugular vein in the neck around some of these vessels that, that you can see on this image and up to the top of the, the brain so it can be aligned with the motor cortex or the part of the brain that's responsible for movement. When people have uh, are thinking about moving, whether they're paralysed or not, even if as long as their brain is, is fine and intact, if they're thinking about moving, parts of their brain will become active. And when they're active, we can now use a device to pick up this information wirelessly transmit it out of the body and interpret it and use it as commands to control external equipment. In terms of our preclinical work, the work that we needed to do uh, to prove that it was safe and prove it was functional before getting into humans, there were three main questions we had. One was the procedure. Can we get a device to be delivered through blood vessels to the motor cortex, to the area of interest? The second question we had was around the signal. If we can get something there, can we record neural information from within a blood vessel that would be useful for a participant to control external equipment? And obviously the third question is safety. Is it safe to leave a device like this permanently implanted within a blood vessel? In terms of the pre procedure, uh, what we discovered was this vein here running down the side of the brain from the motor cortex along, you see it along the, the red motor cortex, was about the same size as the superior sagittal sinus, this central vein here, in a sheep model. Uh, the red here is the motor cortex and the sensory cortex is yellow, so it's a little bit oriented a little bit differently. But we chose this model as if we were able to get devices up through this part of the uh, the vein through the superior sagittal sinus, we can put electrodes against the motor cortex and can record uh, information when the, when the sheep intentionally moves. I developed a, a, the first generation of uh, what we've called a stentrode, a stent electrode array. Uh, this was one that was made in-house. Certainly the ones that we're using now are very different from this. But one of the things I'd like to point out is the the design that we had was to get a device that could be delivered through a very small tube, a very small catheter, like you can see up here at the top. Uh, and the green arrow points to this catheter, which is about a millimetre in diameter. And we want it to be able to be delivered through this catheter. But when it's been delivered to the area of interest, the motor cortex, it can self-expand and compress the electrodes against the vessel wall. And you see here in yellow, this is one of the sensors that we used in the, in the preclinical work. 
So here is a, a, an angiography. I'll show you a few videos as this goes through. Uh, and this is how we would, uh, one method of getting a stentroid into the part of the brain, the motor cortex, in a sheet model. We start with a, a micro wire, which is a very small wire, inside a micro catheter, which is inside a, a larger catheter, and again inside a larger catheter. And as you'll see, uh, it's just navigating, pushing one on top of the other through each other as we go through the internal jugular vein in the, in the side, through the sigmoid sinus, transverse sinus, and then through to the superior sagittal sinus where the motor cortex is. So as you can see here, you're advancing the micro wire, bringing the micro catheters, the delivery catheter and the sheep up around along with it. And then you keep pushing through the, the vessel uh, to get into the skull as it is now and near the brain. When we're in that area, we can do a, an angiography run, a contrast run. So you inject this dye into the veins and the veins uh, after x-ray will light up and then you can see where you are and you'll be able to know where you want to go. And so obviously for us, the motor cortex is around this, this portion here. Uh, and so we know where to where to deploy the, the stentrode. And as you can see, we then continue to, to move further forward. We take all the wires out and really we just push the stentrode through the catheter that you can see we're now pulling back and the stentrode is there uh, and it's been deployed within the superior sagittal sinus in the, in the sheep without brain surgery. As you can see here, so there's the stentrode there. This dot here is the start of one of the catheters that was used to push the device through, the one millimetre catheter. And here again is a larger catheter that was used to push this one through. The procedure itself is, is very quick. Uh, certainly, this was, this was a procedure uh, that I did. I'm, I'm not trained in, in this medically, so I certainly wouldn't do this in, in, in people. Uh, but I have seen the clinicians do this and uh, and they are very fast and they're very good at it. And this is a sort of procedure that is what's called a day procedure. Someone can come into the hospital, have this done, and then they could leave the same day. Uh, this is a common procedure uh, used for removing blood clots. If you have a blood clot in one of your vessels, you put up a series of micro wires and catheters through the blood vessel to, to grab the clot and, and remove it. We're using the same procedure. The only difference is uh, instead of removing all the devices afterwards, we're leaving one of the devices in, the stentrode, the recording device, that can then be used to pick up brain activity. Uh, and over here, you can just see the, the difference between a sheep vessel, which is about three millimetres, and, and, that of a, and that of a human. So the next question is, does it work? Uh, and we were able to show that that the stentro does does work. You can see here, uh, this is a, uh, a the sheep brain. These dots here are where the sensors in this particular animal were located. Uh, that's the same as these sensors on the on the image labelled H. And what you can see is that we were able to get neural information from these different electrodes, and that the neural information from these electrodes was different to each other. In these studies, we implanted the devices for up to 190 days, so over six months, and we were able to see some very good recordings over that period of time. And certainly, the recordings appeared to get better over the first period of time. And I'll explain a little bit more about why that was the case in, in a minute. So what you can see here is what's called maximum bandwidth. This is a measure of how much information you can get from the brain and really what you can see within the first you know uh, first seven days there was quite a large variation but really it was quite stable for 20 weeks to six months uh, across a number of animals in a number of different trials to try and uh, investigate further the quality of the recordings we, we measured something called steady state evoked potentials. And what you can see is that over the first couple of days, the signal quality gets better and then it plateaus. 
which is interesting to note because a lot of the devices that require or have uh, electrodes that are implanted into the brain, their sensors start working really well at the beginning, but over time you'll notice that they they stop working because the, just like a splinter in your finger, your brain acknowledges that there is a foreign material in your brain and will try and push them out. In the case of the stentrode, the vessel does realise there's a foreign material and wants to push it out, but it pushes it out into the blood vessel wall. Uh, it doesn't touch the brain. It's invisible to the brain, but it's pushed out of the blood vessel wall so blood can still flow through. This is a good thing for signal quality because it anchors the signals uh, and the electrodes in place. There's no movement that might change the signals and there's no blood between the electrodes which might uh, interfere with, with the signals and recordings we're getting. We compared the stentrode, which you can see very faintly underneath these large electrodes here, with a subdural array, a device that is placed on the brain surface. And you can see those large electrodes uh, shown here. Uh, we compared the endovascular array or the stentrode to the, the epidural and subdural devices across a range of different frequencies and we found that they were comparable. The stentrode is showing that even though we're inside a vessel, we can still access and record high quality information as we did uh, or as you can with devices that require removal of the skull and electrodes placed onto the brain itself. So in terms of safety, uh, one of the, the studies we did very early on was to understand what happens within the blood vessel. If you're putting a device inside a blood vessel, what you don't want is for the blood vessel to, to occlude or block over. Uh, and indeed, that's, that certainly has not happened in, in any of the preclinical work we've done or any of the, the human work we've done. And the reason is, as I mentioned before, the, the implanted device, uh, the stentrode, self-expands and so the electrodes are placed around the circumference of the, the vessel wall. And then over time, uh, these are pushed further into the vessel wall with the, um, the immune reaction ensuring to keep the, the vessel wall open. What you can see here in uh, the top two images, B and C, and their comparative images, D and E, are these vessels and the, the stentrode. So in B and C, we took some of these uh, animals that had been implanted for up to 190 days or around six months to a synchrotron which allowed us to do high resolution micro CT imaging where we could essentially take slices of the vessel which is shown here as a black circle and we could see where the electrodes were or the sensors and struts on the stentrode were in comparison. Similar in this image here, the circle in the middle is the, the blood vessel and these shiny white uh, star-like dots are the, the electrodes or the, the struts on the stent. As you can see down below, the same thing, however, using uh, conventional staining, blood vessel, the opening is here and the device you can see is, is pushed up around the outside. Some new tissue has grown into the middle to, to push these on the outside. Uh, and anchoring the device in place. As you can see here, blood vessel is nice and open. So the percentage of struts covered, so how many of these struts were incorporated within the vessel as a function of time is shown here, uh, both in micro CT and in histopathology. Not very many over the first two weeks, but certainly after two weeks, you know, almost 100% of the struts had incorporated, showing that the the blood vessel was, was uh, free from this device and the blood could flow freely, freely through the middle of it. So since this, this early work, uh, preclinical work, um, in, in addition to a huge number of other tests we did for, uh, in accordance with standard uh, ISO certifications and FDA requirements, we were fortunate to, to receive approval to do a first in human trial in Australia 
for this trial, we uh, we selected to implant uh, men and women with the stentrode if they had motor neurone disease. So this is a disease that is uh, it's, it's not an accident, it's a, uh, or, or trauma, uh, something that, that will occur and people will lose the ability to, to move their arms and their legs. They'll eventually lose the ability to speak. They'll finally lose the ability to breathe on their own and will either need life support. For, for these men and women, uh, what they said to us is that they really wanted to be able to communicate. They really wanted to be able to write letters to loved ones, write messages and text messages to their, their carers to tell them that they were okay. Uh, and so for us in our first trial, we implanted the, the stentrode in these, in these participants, same procedure, using the device up and into the, the motor cortex. We would then uh, before the procedure, we would do functional imaging, functional MRI that would allow us to identify which parts of the brain uh, were, were the most active. We could then use that information to decide where to deploy the stentrode, where, to, where we needed the sensors to be so we could record the activity that they would be able to produce when they were thinking about performing an intentional movement. And so we implanted the device there. And then after... Uh, a period of time, we were able to get these these people to perform a click action. So, use their mind to essentially press the the mouse button or press a key on a keyboard. One thing that was was interesting to to me was that the the first participant it took uh, quite a long time. It took about forty days before they were able to use the system at home independently, so without researchers present, uh, to control this, this click action. And uh, largely that was because there was a lot of information that we needed to understand on how and what these brain signals were, how to interpret them, and how to use them effectively to control a switch. The next patient took about seven days, and the third and fourth patients, they were able to control this this click switch uh, on, the, on the day that, that the trial started. So as you can see here, uh, we have four impatients implanted. The first one was implanted in August uh, 2019, so more than two years ago. And all of the patients achieved multi-click functionality, which means they could control multiple clicks and not only use different electrodes to control different clicks, but they were able to use the one electrode or the one sensor to control multiple clicks. They were able to use this independently and at home, which is very, very important uh, for communication, online shopping, financial management, uh, control of smart homes and other um, activities of daily living, activities that are taken for granted by, uh, by URI, uh, activities that you know, have a big impact on their lives that we were able to um, help them with by taking their intentional thoughts out of their brain and connecting them to a computer directly. Uh, before I play the, the video, what you can see here is in blue the skull and these dots, these little blue dots underneath are the, the stentrode within this white circle which is the blood vessel showing that the electrode, the stentrode did expand in, in the blood vessel. And then this reconstructed image here showing in blue, again, the vessel, in, in red, the motor cortex, the areas we were trying to, to access, and the electrodes in green around, around these motor cortex. So this uh, image that I'm going to show you is, is of one of our participants uh, texting one of their caregivers. And you can see he's using the, the system to zoom in on the screen. He can move his neck, but he is unable to move his arms. His voice is going, and he's now using the system to, um, you can see him using the, on the right, he just pulled up the keyboard then, and now uh, using eye tracking, he's able to scan to navigate to the letter that he would like to, to use, 
and then click on the letter and start typing messages. One of the things that, that I didn't appreciate until, until being with, with him and his family was not only the, uh, the importance and independence this gave, gave him, but also uh, the freedom it gave his, his wife and carer. Uh, because his voice was going and he found it hard to speak, to, to, be, to be able to communicate with him, she needed to be close by. Uh, however, when we were able to set him up with this, uh, this and other messaging applications, she was able to go into the garden knowing that he could be, she could be contacted. She was able to go down the street without worrying that he would be in trouble because she had her phone and he could contact her if he needed to. Uh, so we've got a long way to go. We've only just started. Um, we have uh, obviously more patients and more trials in Australia. Uh, these ones were in Victoria, but we're branching out to, to Queensland and New South Wales. Uh, we received approval to commence a clinical trial in, in the US. Um, and we also have another uh, other applications of the stentro that we're that we're looking at. So, so we've got a long way to go, but we're we're very we're pleased with what we've been able to achieve. Uh, we're happy that the device is is safe and it works, and it is being used by these participants uh, to enhance the quality of their lives, which is really what we what we decided and designed it for. Uh, so I hope that gives you a little bit of a, a taste of, of what I've been up to and what we've been doing. Uh, and certainly I, I look forward to, to any questions that, that you might have about, about this technology. So thank you. Thank you, sir, for such an insightful lecture. I'm sure that I'm speaking on behalf of the entire audience watching us right now, that you have positively revealed groundbreaking thoughts and promising ideas but instilling a new perspectives in our lives. We now begin the Q&A session to answer a few of our audience questions. So, what were the challenges you faced in designing it in a way it becomes non-invasive? So, the first, uh, the first thing we had to work out was how to make an electrode array that could be delivered through a small tube and then could expand to a larger size uh, when it was in the desired location. There's a material called nitinol, uh, which is a nickel titanium alloy that is super elastic and has self-expanding properties. This is a material that has been used for cardiac stents as well as neurovascular stents. And so in the, in the early days, we were able to take advantage of that material and of the the work that had been done with that material as a as a scaffold or as a as a way to attach sensors so that we could have a device that had multiple uh, states a small state for deployment and a large state when it was in use so that was certainly challenging um, and you know we've come a long way with developing that material and developing the sensors but uh, but we're lucky that that, that existed. Thank you, sir. I'm sure that our audience has learned how to turn crisis into opportunity by that answer. The second question goes, since it launched an execution and medicine in 2017, were there any cases where the device didn't work as it should have and needed any more improvements? If so, which were these cases? Uh, no, we're, we're very lucky that uh, since, since the first implant, we have not had any uh, serious adverse events on, on any of our, uh, with any of our participants. Um, as I said, a number of them have been going for, uh, the, the trial itself went for one year, but obviously we, we continue to follow, to follow them. Um, they've almost all finished that one year uh, trial period without any, without any uh, concerns. Certainly, there, it, it was interesting to note that some of the individuals used different sensors to, uh, to control the, the click. It wasn't always the same sensor for the same individual. Uh, they were, you know, were, the individuals were uni unique in which one they used to, to control the switch and which combination of them. But, um, but no, we're very lucky that, that so far they, they've all worked and that all participants have been able to, to receive benefit from, from the technology. 
Okay, sir. Sir, our next question is the device manufactured through 3D printing or any other industry related technologies. Could we know a bit more about this manufacturing practices? Uh, there's a, a number of different ways it's it's manufactured. Uh, in in general, uh, to make cardiac stents, what they do is is they they laser cut them. So they get a, a rod and they print a design on them and they laser cut that away. Uh, we don't use that that process. We use a, a different process, um, which I won't go into. But it's uh, but certainly there are different ways that you can work with this material nitinol. Um, Obviously, all of the, the devices are manufactured in, in um, certified clean room facilities. They are, they're intended for humans. Uh, and many different processes need to go into making the, the stent itself, the lead, the, the telemetry unit, the, the relays information uh, from within the body externally. Uh, and, and each of these devices, are, you know, they have their own ways of being made. But, um, but yeah, there's... There's a lot of engineering that's gone into it, and it's uh, you know, it's been a lot of fun to to create. Okay, sir. So I believe one needs a lot of self confidence and belief in their sciences to come this far. So when you look back into your achievement, what are a couple of things you're proud of? Uh, I think the biggest one. I'm I'm really proud of the team that we've been able to to put together. Um, a, a lot of the a lot of the team are. Uh, are very young. This was their sort of first or second jobs, uh, and you know they were just very passionate, like I was, about about making biomedical products, making technology that can help other people. Uh, so really, I'm very proud of the team that we've put together and the work and effort that they have put in to, to making to making this a, a success. Uh, as I said, it's it's very early days. We've got a long way to go, and the, the team is growing and. Uh, I think that that's one of the things that I'm, I'm most proud of, the, the people that I have around me uh, and being able to tell others that, that I work with such an amazing group of people is, um, is very fantastic. So that's quite fascinating. Our next question, what are your expectations for the bionic industry in the coming 10 to 15 years? Do you see more AI driven research or a significant human involvement too? Uh, I, I think it's um, it's going to be very interesting and fascinating what happens in the next uh, in the next decade or so. Certainly, their um, medical technology and the way of making it's got to a stage that uh, it's it's now going from research where people have been asking a lot of questions and understanding how the brain works and how we can access it and how we can extract information and use it to control things. There's a lot of um, uh, industry excitement around this area. People wanting to make devices that that go the step further from research into into homes and in clinical practice. Uh, and I think there's going to be a huge number of technologies that come out, both from robotics, uh, you know, whether it be robotic arms or legs, um, other ways to interface with the brain. You obviously have cochlear implants. There. Are, there are bionic eyes, there are ways that you can put stimulation back into the brain to help people with epilepsy or, or depression. There's a huge amount of work that's been done on on a large number of fields on how how we can really make take advantage of the brain and how we can help those with, with various different conditions. And I think it's, it's fascinating. The fields are going to grow, and, and certainly I think that means that there's going to be a lot of human involvement and, and certainly a lot of AI-assisted research done as well. So that's a great outlook. Moving on, what sparked your interest in bioelectronics and what kind of research are you pursuing right now? Uh, my interest, I think, came from... I've always been very passionate about, uh, about making things. I've always wanted to make things. Uh, and I've always been very interested in the, the human body and how the human body works and functions uh, both properly and and when it's not functioning properly, and I guess through through university, uh, it came clear that you could put both together. I could I could join my love of uh, of making things with my interest for for the human body and how it works, and and make different body parts, I suppose, or, or make devices and technologies that could that could help people or could overcome different difficulties that the people might have. Um, for whatever reason, trauma or disease or otherwise. So 
so I've always been interested in, in combining those two those two fields together. So that's quite interesting. And so, what advice would you give for young students like us who want to achieve high honors in their work and become distinguished and renowned innovators like yourself? Uh, I really think you just need to find something that you enjoy, uh, find something that you you want to work on. It, it makes and surround yourself by by people you want to work with. Um, I know I make it sound easy, but if if you can find something that you're passionate about, and it doesn't really matter what it is, if you're passionate about it, and you want to get up in the morning to do that, uh, you will have a lot of enthusiasm. You'll have a lot of excitement. You you'll want to go further because you're interested in it and. If you can do that, then you'll, you'll find people who are the same as you, who share the same passions as you do. Uh, and if you're lucky, you'll be able to find a team where you can all work together on the same problems. But I think my biggest piece of advice was um, don't be concerned about what, if what you're interested in is not the same as anyone else. Um, you, you need to really be true to yourself and, and find what you want to do and, and really figure out how you can, how you can turn that into a career. So that's very inspiring and we are truly honoured by your presence today. It was indeed an impactful session. Also, thank you to our wonderful audience for tuning in. We hope you all enjoyed the session. I am Sushmita Gaude signing off. Until next time, this is Techno Manza Vijay Thank you. Thank you, sir.